Hi, welcome. It's Paul Tilley, and uh, today in marketing research, we're going to be discussing sample designs, sampling procedures, and sample sizes. First, I'd like to take you through some of the specific topics we're going to be looking at. First, we're going to define what a population, a census, and a sample is. We're going to explain why researchers use samples. We're going to decide that we're going to talk about the appropriate samples to be able to to get good, to good uh, results from. We're going to design appropriate sample. We're going to use appropriate statistical tools to extract useful information from samples and identify the key concepts in the sample plan. We're going to control for errors and reduce the number of chances of, reduce the chances of problems resulting. We're going to illustrate distinctive features of probability and number probability samples. We're going to calculate and interpret what's meant by the mean, the median, the mode, and standard deviation variance, these sorts of things. We're going to develop frequency diagrams, and finally we're going to calculate how to calculate sample sizes. The first thing we really need to do is define exactly what we mean by some of the terms we use in sampling. The first term that we're going to look at is population. Population refers to any complete group. So the population is normally the entire group. Now, our study population refers to the, the group that we're studying. For example, if we're thinking about population, are we talking about the country of Canada? That could be a population group. Or if we're only talking about the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, that could be a population group. If we're only talking about a town, that could be a population group. So depending on what we're researching, the population will vary. The point is, is that the population is as we define it. And we have to, whenever we're doing this research, define exactly what is meant by the relevant population. So one of the first things you do whenever you do this type of research is define your population. Now that we have an understanding of population is think about how do we ask the population a question. So when we think about asking the population a question, we really have two choices. We ask everybody or we ask a representative sample. Now, for most research, representative sample is used, and there's a number of reasons. There's normally pragmatic reasons. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's easier. Sometimes, however, we insist on asking everybody, and when we insist on asking everyone, this is known as a census. Now, census are very rarely used. The government, for example, does a census of Canada, and that's where everybody in Canada has an opportunity to contribute to the census. The thing is with a census is that when you have to ask everybody, it takes time and energy and effort. And a lot of companies or a lot of research projects don't have that time and energy and effort. And the payoff is not that great, so uh, it, it's rarely done in practical reasons. So we have then the sample. And the idea of the sample is that we know the statistical theory that if we ask what's called a representative sample, meaning that the people that we draw out of the sample are representative of the entire population. And we can assure that by using various sampling techniques that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But essentially, when we go to do a sample, statistical theory says that if our sample is big enough, and if we're willing to accept a little bit of variation between what really the population is and what our sample says it is, if we're willing to do those things, and we only have so much money, and we only have so much time, and we only have so many resources, the sample will yield good enough results. Good enough meaning plus or minus two percentage points from whatever a real number is, or three percentage points from whatever a real number is. The sample will yield good enough information that we can make a decision on it based on that. And the idea that we're doing American research anyway is to help make us make decisions, better decisions. So as long as we can get decent information, our decision will be rightly affected by that information. So that information will be good enough in order to make a decent decision on it. So sampling is often good enough for our purposes. So when we think about sampling, the sampling process involves drawing conclusions based on a few of the entire population not the exact number of people in the population, but a representative sample of the population. By taking samples, it's easier, faster, and cheaper than taking a census. Sample size relative to the population size will determine how accurate the results are. The bigger the sample, 
the more accurate results. Smaller samples, less accurate results. Samples may have to be used at certain times too. We, for example, in testing, if, if for example you build a brand new airplane, you want to check to see if the airplane is safe. Well, if you were to actually not use the sample, you'd have to really break the airplane or do something with it in order to check that it was safe. And then, well, if you broke it, it wouldn't be much point. So what we do is we normally take a sample, a sample airplane or a sample part, and we test it. And we destroy it as opposed to the full item. So we test wings, for example, in airplanes or test it on a rig. And these, they're stretched and bent so far. And based on that result, then we say that the rest of the fleet must be safe based on our sample. So sampling is used for very good reasons. We do sampling in cement. We do sampling on roads. We do sampling on all kinds of practical things that are out there in the world. And based on those samples, we make draw conclusions and we make decisions on the entire population. In any research, we need to be able to go through a process in order to be able to collect relevant information. The process that we're looking at here is the actual collection of data process. And the first thing we need to do is define our population. What is the study population that we're looking at? So it could be Canada, could be the province of Newfoundland, could be a town. We define that. Second, we say, okay, this is the sampling, what we call the sampling frame. This is the elements of the population that we're going to draw from. So if, for example, we're testing uh, the population of Clarenville to determine their favorite pizza type, our sample frame would be people who live in the town of Clarenville. Okay. Then we determine how we're actually going to collect the sample information. Is it going to be a probability sample, meaning every single person who lives in the boundaries of Clarenville have an identical chance of being selected to do this study? So if there's 6,000 people in Clarenville, everybody has a 1 in 6,000 chance. This is compared against a non-probability sample where through uh, decisions made by the samplers, we're going to decide who we're actually going to sample. So a non-probability sample could be, for example, going to pick you and you and you because you're relatively close to me. That's an example of a non-probability sample. Now the challenge with non-probability samples is that they do not yield the same quality results as a probability sample does. Probability sample, everyone has an equal chance, you're more likely to get a representative population. Non-probability sample, not everyone has an equal chance, you're more likely to get a group that you're familiar with. So the results won't be as good. The non-probability sample is a lot easier to collect, but the trade-off is, is the quality of it is not as great. Once you do uh, that, you need to be able to lay out your sampling procedure. How are you actually going to do the sample? Uh, there are numerous ways, and we'll look at those in a few minutes um, to do this. We also need to determine what size of a sample size we need. Do we need one person, ten people, fifty people, five thousand people? This all depends on the size of your population, depends on how accurate you want it to be. There are a lot of factors that influence the size, and we need to determine that. Once we get the size straightened away, we're going to pick the actual sampling units. For example, we're going to pick people, families, households. What will be the unit of sample that we're busy with? And next, we need to actually go out and do the collection, which is called field work. How do we actually go out and do that? So we're going to look at that whole thing here in this section now coming up. The first, uh, we need to, to clearly define some terminologies. The first thing we looked at here is a sampling frame. A sampling frame relates to a list of elements from which we can draw the sample. So our sampling frame could be a defined population. So for example, the town of Clarenville, everybody who lives in the town of Clarenville is eligible to be selected. That's what we call the sampling frame. It's our working population. These sample frame then uh, is drawn and when it's drawn, we're going to get some results. So let's say, for example, we ask 20 people, and the 20 people give us a result. I like pepperoni pizza. Now, the 20 people are kind of standing in for all of Clarenville. So the 20 people say that they prefer pepperoni pizza. What is the chances that that 20 people actually represent the entire population of Clarenville? Probably not the greatest. So what we need to be able to do is to think about how much air we're willing to accept. If, for example, we draw a small sample, how is that going to be in terms of representing the entire population? 
this is where sample size comes into play and we need a larger sample size in order to get that good representation. If we're willing to accept a lot of error on our sample, let's say for example if 20% of the people say they like pepperoni and pizza, if we're willing to accept 20% of your way, so 0% or 40%, if we think that's good enough for us in order to make the decision, then that's good enough. We're willing to accept that amount of error on our sample size. If it's a large sample error we're willing to accept, our sample size doesn't need to be as big. We want a small sample error, our sample size has to be bigger. There are two major types of, two major categories of, of sampling that can go on. Non-probability sampling and probability sampling. Each of those categories can be subdivided into a specific type of sampling methodology. First we'll take a look at non-probability sampling. Now if you recall, non-probability sampling means that not everyone has the same chance of being selected. It's more of a convenience type thing. We just pick you because you're over there, and you because you're over here, and you because you're close, and you because I know you. So this is what we mean by non-probability sampling. Now non-probability sampling comes in a variety of types. We're going to look at four here now. The first one is something called convenience sampling. Now convenience sampling is really sampling that is convenient to the sampler. So if, for example, I'm in a room and I'm thinking about doing some research and I got 20 people around me, I say, well, how about you? you? You guys will do fine. That's what's known as a convenient sample. We're taking people who are convenient to get at. They may not represent the population, but they're going to give us some information. The next type of uh, not probability sampling that comes up is something called a judgment sample. A judgment sample means that we use sort of a professional judgment in order to pick people for our sample. So we're talking to someone who knows the town and say, well, okay, uh, there's a bunch of people who live up in that subdivision there. They'd be really good to talk to. So let's go up there and pick them. And there's a, another bunch over here. They're involved heavily in the community. They'd be able to tell you a lot of information. Let's go over and pick them. And there's another group down there. They have some problems and, and be good to hear from them. So let's, let's pick them. This is what we call a judgment sample. We, we use someone who's familiar with the area or is familiar with the topic will use their judgment to select certain people that they think can yield some useful information. Again, it's very much a non-probability and it's very much open to some sort of a bias or error from the point of view that what the sample says doesn't necessarily reflect what the population would say. The next type of sampling we got is a quota sample. Now a quota sample is used whenever we have to get a representation that reflects uh, the population. So let's assume, for example, that the population is exactly 50% men and 50% women. We know that for certain. So we need to get a sample that is a sample, but also it has to be 50% women and 50% men. Let's assume we're drawing numbers out of a hat or drawing names out of a hat. The names come up and the first 20 names we pick are all men. Are all men. Well, we're only going to pick 40 people, so if the first 20 were all men, that means really in order to get an even balance, the next 20 needs to be only women. So when we think about a quota sample, what it says is that we're going to select enough people to fill a given category. Once that category is filled, then we're going to only select people who can meet another category. So for example, if we got all the women, all the men uh, selected, then we're going to switch and we're going to pick all men, or all, all women, sorry. So we're going to uh, pick the category that, we're going to fill the categories according to the need. And so effectively, not everyone has an equal chance of being selected because once all the men are filled, there's no more chance of another man being selected. That's what's known as a quota sample. The fourth and final one of this that we're looking at is something called a snowball sample. And you know how, for example, when you're out playing in wet snow and you kind of do have a ball of snow and you kind of roll it in the snow? and how it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we roll it along. Well, that's exactly how snowball sampling works. What snowball sampling is useful for is when you have a pretty obscure type topic that you're studying. Let's say, for example, we're going to study people who have model trains. So, as you're probably aware, not everybody has a model train that they play with or they use. So, one of the things we want to be able to do is do a research study in the people who have model trains. So, let's do a random sample. Let's go pick. We could phone literally a thousand people and say, do you have a model train? And they're going to say, no, 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 no. So we're not going to get a high take up on it. So how can we make it more efficient? Well, what we do is we do this probability thing until we hit somebody that says, yes, I have a model train. 
Okay? So they're going to say, and instead of going on, we're going to ask that person, who else do you know who has a model train? Oh, well, I know Jim and Bob and Phil and Fred and Linda. They all have model trains as well. So we take their various phone numbers and we call them. And each one of them, we say, well, do you know of anyone else who has a model train? So effectively, our sample size grows based on picking people that meet a certain criteria, model train owners. So this means that Phil will be able to tell us three people, and Jerry will be able to tell us three people, and Fred will be able to tell us three people, and it will grow and grow and grow, grow based on that. Again, very much a non-probability because we're only selecting people that people tell us to select. So again, does it represent the population? So that's the non-probability. Next, let's take a look at probability sampling and look at the various types of probability sampling. And for our purposes, we're looking at four major types here. The first one is something called a simple random sample. Now, a simple random sample is essentially that. It is putting a bunch of names, for example, in a hat. And those names are all on identically sized pieces of paper. We take the hat and we shake the hat or we run the hat around and we put our hand and we pick out a name. Now that name had a one in however many names were in the hat chance of being selected. Then we pull out another one and another one and another one. They all had equal chances of being selected. This is exactly what a simple random sample does. Everybody's name in the population goes into the proverbial hat and we pick them out. So every single one has an equal chance of being selected. This is what is defined as a simple random sample. Next, we have something called a stratified sample. And what a stratified sample does is it really divides or groups up, uh, groups up um, a bunch of people. So in this case, if, for example, we were talking about, um, oh, I don't know, uh, faculty at the College of North Atlantic and students at the College of North Atlantic and staff at the College of North Atlantic. Let's assume those are three types. So how could we get a representative sample so that we ensure that we have faculty represented, staff represented, and students represented? Well, what we'll do is we'll break it into three lots, and we'll put all the names of respective people into three hats. Staff hat, a faculty hat, and a student hat. From there, then we pull out a random sample out of each hat. So everybody is randomly selected. It's just that it's stratified in the sense that the first selection is just of students, the second selection is just of staff, and the third selection is just of faculty. And this would be done on a proportionate basis. So if students are 50%, 50% of the pullouts would be students. If faculty represent 20%, 20% of the pullouts would be faculty, and so on. Next, we look at something called a cluster sample. And what a cluster sample does is it allows you to group together groups of items. So the purpose of cluster sampling is to, to sample economically in groups. So you're not necessarily looking at an individual element. You're looking at bunches of groups. So it could be, for example, uh, the provinces of Canada, B.C., Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and so on. All of the provinces. And then we're going to take a representative sample from each of those provinces. And this is what's meant as a close cluster sample. So we draw clusters of samples. So that that's the basic types of uh, probability samplings. And you should be aware of all of those. So now that we've seen some of the sampling types and the sampling designs and probability sampling, non-probability sampling, you're probably asking, well, what should I pick? I don't know. Well, it really depends on the type of research you're doing, and there's several factors you need to be aware of so that you weigh in these various attributes into any decision you make. First, you think about the degree of accuracy. How much accuracy do you want? Probability samples, samples large size, tend to be more accurate than non-probability samples, small size. Uh, the resources. How much resources do you have? Do you have lots of time, money, and energy? these sorts of things. If you do, then you can do a pure probability sample where you use all the proper techniques. If you don't have a lot of resources, don't have a lot of time, maybe you have to resort to some other less rigorous type sampling procedure. Uh, time, big one. If you got a lot of time, 
a strict system of collecting data might be very good. If you don't have a lot of time, probably a convenient sample will work a little bit better to give you some information rather than none. Uh, advanced knowledge of the population. If you have a really good understanding of the population and where the population are clustered, maybe judgment sample will work just fine. And, and that would be a non-probability. If you don't have a good knowledge of the population, you're going to have to get some sort of a heavy-duty probability sample to ensure that you get a good cross-section of all elements of the population. We also got to think about national versus local. Is it a national research? National research, you're going to need to think about things like uh, doing some sort of a, a sampling system to ensure that you get good representation. Cluster sampling, for example, would work there well. Whereas if it's very local, uh, probably just a simple random sample would do fine of your local population. And how much statistical analysis you're planning on doing this and the type of decision you're going to meet, reach from it is going to make a big difference to what type of sampling you do. You know, how important is this data? If it's really important, and it's very important to be accurate, you need to have a lot of statistical rigor with your study. If it's not so important or if it's not so you know, critical, less rigor is fine. So after you select your sample design, you need to go out and do some things like determine your sample size and how to lay out the data that you collect in terms of frequency diagrams and the like. So we're actually going to look at that next. In order to be assess, in order to assess sample size, you need to know some basic statistical theory concepts. Now I'm going to rely on the fact that you know these from your statistics course. But I'll do a quick review. First of all, you have to understand the basic concept of mean, median, and mode. The mean is the statistical average of the numbers, where you take the numbers, you add them up, and divide by the total number of numbers, that will give you the average. The median, if you took all the numbers that you have and you line them up from the smallest number to the biggest number, and cut them in the middle, basically halfway up, that number in which the cut takes place would be the median. It is the middle number. Half the values are above it, half the values are below it. Then we have the mode. The mode infers a most often, M-O-D-E, most often. It is the most often occurring number. So if you had a sample and the number 10 popped up more than any other number, that would be the mode. Very simple concepts. We also th think of other things like the range. How, what is the range of numbers? And one of the biggest concerns in all statistics is how widespread is this? So if the numbers run from 1 to 30, for example, that means we have a spread of 30 numbers. If the numbers run from 29 to 34, we have a much smaller spread in numbers. So the range represents the highest number to the lowest numbers, the difference between the highest and the lowest. And when we do statistics and statistical analysis, measuring that range and the variation as a result of the range is very important in making decisions. So we need to be aware of the concept of range. And in terms of collecting range information, range information is used to calculate another statistic called the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a statistical theory that says that the mean, the average number, will fall in the middle and other numbers will fall around that in a particular pattern. And that pattern, as represented by the graphic I'm putting up here now, says that about 50% of the numbers will be above and 50% will be below the mean. In addition, one standard deviation out on to higher or lower than the mean will be about 34% of the numbers will fall within one standard deviation. About 95% of the numbers will fall within two standard deviations, and about 99% of the numbers will fall within three standard deviations. In this graphic, you can see that effectively we have the, a bell-shaped curve resulting from that. And the bell-shaped curve is that way because it represents the proportion of the numbers that fall close to the mean. The, the center is the mean. So 34% fall one standard deviation above, 34% fall one standard deviation below. The second standard deviation is the 13.59% above and below, and the third standard deviation is 2.14. Now, I mentioned before that 
you know, it's about 95% of the numbers and 99% of the numbers represent the second and third standard deviation. Well, you got to think 2.14 and 2.14 is about 5, close to 5. That's where we get that 95% are within two standard deviations of the mean. So this is called a normal distribution. And if we've got a large enough set of numbers that we're calculating for our sample size is large enough, the data in that should fall out normally, meaning it will fall around the mean in this type of pattern. So with the basic knowledge of statistics and understanding how standard deviation works and understanding means, modes, and medians, we should be able to calculate the sample size. You will notice that sample size really has three major ingredients. The standard deviation of the population, an estimate of that. The magnitude of the acceptable error, meaning how much of an error from what we say the number is in the sample to what the actual population number is. And something we call confidence, which is how, how assured we are that our population is represented by that sample. Now, so if we had those three bits of information, we should be able to collect and calculate a sample size. I have there two equations. The first equation is for the in calculating using means, calculating all sample sizes using means. There, the number n represents uh, the number of items in the sample. Z represents the standard deviation confidence interval, 95%, 1.96 to Z value 1.96. Standard deviations, the estimate uh, deviation for the population, we can either estimate that or we can use the standard deviation of the sample as a, a fill-in for that. And the acceptable error, which is plus or minus so many percent of the, the number that we say is, is the average versus what the population average is. We plug the numbers into the formula, ZS squared over E, and that should give us how many people how many things we need in order to make a representative sample. Obviously, as standard deviation declines, our sample size will go up. As our uh, error, acceptable error, goes down, our sample size will go up. The second type of formula is used whenever we have population proportions. For example, a chance of it working, a chance of it not working. So there we use a formula n equals z squared p q, which, which is probability of it happening and probability of it not happening, over e squared. You simply plug the numbers in there, and it will give you the number to count, uh, the number of samples, the, sum, the size of the sample that is required. The next thing that you should be able to look at is frequency distribution. You should be aware of using frequency distribution. A frequency distribution is really pigeonholing a, a, a number that you get into a category. So for example, you'll see on this frequency distribution of deposits here, we have deposit amounts less than 3,000 between 3 and 4,999 and so on. And all we do is we put the number of deposits that fall in each of the categories. So we had a total of 3,120 deposits and all we're doing in frequency distribution is putting them in the category based on the amount of the value of the, of the actual draw item. You'll notice from this that we should be able to determine that most, the highest number of, the most frequent, I should say, the most frequent um, deposit is in the ten dollars to $15,000 range. So frequency distribution is pretty simple. So in this unit, we've had an opportunity to look at sampling and sample size. And it's very important that you have a good understanding of this, particularly for your research paper. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call or email me, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.